Beautiful. Well, welcome to all the community members that are here today and those that are going to listen to this afterwards. Um, it's been a couple of weeks since we've been together, so it's really nice to see everybody's smiling faces. And we just like to do these virtual meetups because we're living in that hybrid world. And each week we try to invite some people uh, to share their story, to share some silver linings, what they're doing and how they're finding the courage to continue. Um, and we've had some amazing stories over the course of the last few months. Today we have Michelle with AJM Financial and we are just so excited to have her because she is a big contributor to the community and she just loves having dialogue and conversations that are more context than they are content and I love that about her. So Michelle, thank you for being here today. Um, I'm going to have everybody that's here to support you introduce themselves because we love when people feel committed to and we want you to feel committed to and we want the community members to feel heard and committed to. So I will start. My name is Adam Griggs. I'm the co-founder of Clarify, and I'm your moderator today. And I will turn it over to Rachel over at GoDaddy. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Really happy to always have our members here with us. Really excited to, to hear from Michelle today. She's been a great contributor. And um, so I actually manage community experiences for um, GoDaddy. And, you know, one large part of what I do, and it's really important for us, is to be able to to get you all together, to have you all meet and share. And so that's one of the one of the things that we love most about our LinkedIn group and just seeing relationships form. And so we're excited about Adam's uh, great ability to uh, to host these and get um, get it, that we get to hear from you. So thanks so much. Well, thanks for being here. And I appreciate that. Sometimes it's kind of pulling through right <laughs> today we're on an internet outage so i'm actually doing this from my phone technology's fun i appreciate uh, rachel and the team for being here jesse do you want to introduce yourself and then jonathan sure uh i'm jesse wilson i work at godaddy as well i'm a community manager um i tend to be more on the back end of things uh, but i do uh, interface with customers and the community itself and uh, try to help out there and uh I, I wasn't going to join today, but then I saw that the, the topic was about financial uh, stuff, and uh, I'm that's an area that I'm not great at. I was literally talking to my wife about this um, last night. I'm like, I, I don't, I should probably learn more about this. So I thought I'd uh, check in and see what Michelle had to say. And hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan. Um, I also work for GoDaddy. I'm on the social media team, uh, primarily focusing on engagements, but I've been working very closely with uh, Rachel and Jesse on helping to develop the LinkedIn community. And again, I echo everything they said. I love these, these weekly meetups and I'm so excited for today because quite like Jesse, um, I certainly feel like there's always room to learn more about, about finances. And my, my dad is a, was a financial advisor for years and years and years and like instilled a lot in me, but also like did that thing where he was my dad and like, I'm just not gonna listen to everything he says. So I'm very excited to listen to you because then I can and not only have him validated, but I can walk away with some good info. So thank you for being here, I'm so excited. I love it. Perspective is everything in life, right? So um, thank you guys for being here and to the GoDaddy team for just making the community what it is. I mean, everything that we do is a conversation and that's what drives communities. So thank you for being here to support us. Uh, we're going to have George introduce himself and then Julie. Hi there, <clears throat> George Gilbert. I, uh, I'm the owner and founder of Too Good Software. Um, I've been, a, my website's been on GoDaddy for over 20 years. Um, so I might as well be called staff, I guess. Um, anyway, I've, I've developed software for uh, managing household finances. That's an entirely new approach that I'm trying to introduce people to. And toward that end, I just published a book called uh, Getting Comfy with Your, uh, with Your Money. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here to listen and uh, see what uh, Michelle has to say. And um, I love talking about finances. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here, George, and so exciting that you published the book, and I love all the contributions you've given to the community in regards to that, so thank you for, for being here to support Michelle and the community and having, you know, context in the conversation. Julie. Good morning, or good afternoon for many of you. I'm Julie. Um, I own and the founder of Stick and Stack. We sell eco-friendly um, stickers made out of recycled water bottles, but discovering more and more later, lately, um, about the passion and vision of Stick and Stack is really evolving into supporting our artists, but also really getting to connect with my customers about um, 
getting their brand out as an art and really um, just thinking about the bigger picture of what Stick and Stuff really is, is kind of taking it to a next level. And the connections with this group and having those conversations is, has elevated the concept of Stick and Stuff for me. Um, and so just a lot of gratitude for this group and the willingness for people to share and really get um, personal, which uh, has helped me immensely in Stick and Stuck because it is so personal as we realize our, 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 our businesses are our passions. And I'm super excited to be here with Michelle. I love your attitude. I know this is going to be a great talk and approach about money. And I just have this like fear around it. So I see money and I just kind of makes me anxious <laughs> because I don't know sometimes what to do with it or not educated enough or, you know, like that there's something I'm supposed to be doing that I'm not. So I'm just really excited to hear your take on it today. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. So thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Julie. And it's been exciting to watch your collaboration and your brand just evolved the way that it has. So thank you for being here. Uh, Julie was a past guest on the show as well. So if you haven't watched hers, go back, check it out. Uh, she's doing some great things with women entrepreneurs and artists and just allowing them space to, to create um, through communities. So Michelle, thank you for being here today. Let's hear a little bit about you, what makes you you, and how on earth you can tackle such an intimidating conversation like personal finance. That's so funny. Well, thank you everyone who's here today, um, you know, to hear what I have to say and just talk about getting into this business and, um, you know, the passion for it, as Adam said on the uh, post, it is a love for me because I don't like to watch people suffer. And when you're suffering because you're in your own way, that's a different problem. And especially when it's about money, because it's so emotional. Most people want to look like everyone else, you know, because we talk about how the new age group of people, because I hate saying millennials, but, you know, you have to label everything that, you know, they like to be together, you know, in the office and, you know, just be um, around each other. So we have that thing that we do want to be a part of, you know, and be like someone. So if everyone has, we want to have too. But my focus was always about if you can't afford it, I don't need you going out trying to fake it. You know, that saying that you say, um, fake it till you make it. Well, that's one of the things you don't need to fake, that you have money and you don't. Not that you just don't have it, but you don't know how to manage it. And people often think if they have more, that they will do better. If you can't manage $10, you won't manage 20. If you can't manage 30,000, you won't manage 60. So I come from a, um, a place of just, I wanna say like down home grassroots part of it. So it's not about telling you to invest here, invest there and invest there because if you're managing your paycheck terribly, you're gonna manage your investments terribly as well. You're gonna make the wrong mistakes, maybe not invest enough or invest too much and you lose a lot. Now you think investing is the worst thing in the world. So I try to handle it from a literacy point of view. And that's why I consider myself and call myself a personal finance instructor. I'm instructing you on how to manage your paycheck, how you can live you know, a decent life with what you have. It doesn't have to be one without, it still can be one with, but you do it consciously. So that's where the passion comes from. And, you know, um, I talk, I've talked about my story for uh, many years um, in different formats. I've written articles for the Atlanta Voice as a local newspaper. I talked about my first job story, um, you know, um, on a blog website with a connection on LinkedIn, actually. And um, I talked about my first aha moment with the first job. And everything kind of stemmed from that because my goal was to show that it's not how much money you make, and this is to my mom, how much money that you make is what you do with what you make. So to kind of lead into this, um, the passion of it is my first job, I made $90 a week. So yes, that is a long time ago. And it was a, I was a day camp counselor. I was the um, senior day camp counselor. So I made $90 a week. So with that $90, I had to pay $10 rent. My mother said, you cannot stay anywhere for free. So I guess that was my lesson in life about what you need to do with your money. So um, doing that, um, I gave her $10, then there was $80 left. But remember, I still had to have lunch. I still needed transportation money to get to that job. And um, 
it was a lesson. It was a lesson, but I was determined to show that I was going to make this work. So that first week I was able to pay her, make sure I had my needs intact, which is that transportation, that food, because I did not want to sit around looking at everyone else eat. And I wasn't around the corner from my home, so I couldn't run home for lunch. But that was the whole point. But I still have money left over. And that's the problem that most people have is they don't realize when they don't create whether you call it a budget, a needs and wants list, which I tend to call it, whatever you want to do, you have to have some kind of plan, manage it and see what's coming in and then what you actually spend out. My list wasn't long over $90, but I knew I needed those things. So with what was left over, I decided to do something positive with it. I actually renovated my room. Now this is at 17. So no one's really teaching this. You didn't learn it in high school. You didn't learn it in grade school. And so it was just something that I did. To me, it just flowed naturally. That's what I'm going to do. And each week after, I did the same thing. I had to pay for this, pay for that. And the next thing, I had money after that month was over because that job was only lasting for a month. It was obviously part-time summer job, but enough to be able to carry me when I did get a permanent job in corporate world to make sure I could get back to that job, have lunch money, and be able to you know, take care of the things that I need. So it really is about managing what you have. It's about knowing what you have. Some people don't even know what they bring home. Oh, they know they make 50,000 a year, but they don't really look at their pay stubs because first of all, everything's direct deposited now. You're not paying attention to things because we're so busy running in life, again, trying to keep up with certain groups, whatever you wanna call them. I know in the past, everyone said the Joneses, but I say Kardashians because that's today. So <laughs> I'm not trying to keep up with anybody. And I've, I've said this on another show that I don't have FOMO. I don't have the fear of missing out. So when you think about the emotional part of dealing with money, that's where most people go wrong. You don't know what you're bringing in. You don't know what's going out. So you don't know if you have anything left over. I've worked with clients that that actually happened. I'm like, you do have something left over. We can get this debt paid off. We can get some savings done. I just wrote, um, I just posted my newsletter that I send out, you know, um, at least twice a month. And I talked about saving for retirement in one of the pieces and just simple stuff. I'm not asking you to go make these big deals and big changes, but you can take $20 a month and save that for a whole year. You have $240, $240 at the end of the year, you can go put in a credit union and as, as an IRA share account, you have something that you started, especially if you're a young person starting out. I'm not talking about if you're a late starter because we know you have to have way more money to put away at that point at 50 than you do at 25. But that's a start. You can find $20. And then the next year you do the same thing, but you increase it to 25. Now you have $300. You have that 540 that you're, you're earning interest on. So that first 240, you're earning interest on that money. But who can't find $20? If you take away some of the things we really don't need, the emotional things like, well, I have to have my blank coffee, I won't say any names. I have to have my so-called uh, smoothie, I won't say any names. I have to have so-and-so, those little things, I mean, a Nutribullet can handle that. I have one, I'd make one every day. I'm not so good right, right now, you know, we're home, so I kind of do what I want. But, you know, you can have, you can still have those things, but you have to make the changes for it. At some point, you have to decide whether you are gonna stay in the space that you're in with the salary that you have. So if the thing is you really don't have enough money, because when I first moved here, I went to one of those classes. I said, let me figure out what's going on. And this is what I want to do anyway. And at the end of the day, when I've got, gone through that whole list, all I saw was that I really needed another job. There was nothing else for me to give up. So you have to get to that determination. But if you never sit down with your money, how can you get to that determination? So when people ask me now that, and I think I've shared this story with you all before, I was restructured out of my day job that I worked for 19 years back at the end of 2019. So many people ask, you know, well, what are you going to do? How are you going to make it? I'm going to be fine. Because all those years that people would talk about, you don't, don't use the word budget, that's too restrictive. You know, um, you, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't live this way, you don't live that way. I'm living fine because I still eat every day. I have a place to live. I have a home to live in. But all those years of working at that place, making sure my goal was to pay off my debt and student loan was number one because I did not want to go into retirement with bills. 
So I focused, I mean, I, I was killing that student loan. I know those people were like just a sick of me because A, they weren't getting any interest because I'm paying and I'm paying and I paid more. So I'm getting that principal down. Then B, I was new to having a car. I didn't drive before where I lived because there was mass transit. So now I have a car note, insurance and maintenance and this, but people don't put away for that. If you have a car, you should have a maintenance budget. Because one thing you're going to have to do is get an oil change. Another thing you're going to have to do is get some tires. At some point, I just had to get to um, last month. You're going to have these expenses, but we don't plan for them. And that's how we get in financial trouble as well. We think, oh, when it comes up, I'll take care of it. No, I'm planning for these things. So the other thing is I didn't want to have a car note forever. I kept my first car, I can say that, for 16 years. And most people would never do that. Because as soon as the new car comes out, they're ready to get another one. No, I kept that car for 16 years because I had to get some piece of space like the transmission. And at that point, to me, that's a new car. So I kept it another five years, just like a regular loan. And that helped me to get, when I got the new car, it's paid for. So my focus is about not having enough, uh, not having debt consistently and constantly. So most people will pay for a car, then get a new one. Or they're not even finished for that car, they trade it in. When do you stop paying the car company? I don't want to single anybody out in case, you know, someone else is listening and they want to, you know, uh, what is it, the check the, um, the copyright issues or whatever. But no, wh when do you stop paying for that? You could be doing something else with that money. You could be saving for that future because none of no, no job is ever promised to you. And this is not the first time I've been restructured or laid off from a job. Actually, this is the second time. And the first time I went back to school, unemployed and living on my own, I was not a child and still was able to make it through, graduate and move on. And so the things that I teach people is yes, you have to look at your money. You have to create a budget, whether whatever you wanna call it or not, you have to do something. It's like any plan. If you go on vacation, you plan for that. You have the itinerary down, you know where you're going, you know when your flight leaves, you know what transportation you're going to get to the airport and back into the hotel, you know what you're going to do when you get there, but you can't manage $20 to come up with to just say, I'm going to put this aside. Because once you have that money, you start seeing it grow, you don't want to stop. You almost get addicted to it because now it becomes a challenge. So for me, that's what I did. So my goal again was to really not have issues in retirement, because that's when your income stops. It's basically cut permanently, because there are no, if you, even if you save for 401k, IRA, which I always teach people about, I could talk a little bit about that as well, but you're not getting earnings from anyone. You're getting a social security check and whatever money you have saved. And if you didn't save that money, now you just have social security. You don't get raises every year. And whatever you get is that cost of living, it's what? 3%, 2%? That barely covers the cost of the rise in food. We're not talking in anything else, just the rise of food. I noticed that um, since last year, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, and you go into the supermarket, there are two items that I love, I really like. I'm not going to mention the names though, but two items I really love. These two items went up a dollar. Not 20 cents, not 30 cents, but a whole dollar. So you think about that. Everything else is going up. But just with food alone, your social security check is not going to cover it because it's almost like unemployment. You're getting, you're getting a percentage of whatever earnings you've made over your lifetime. So for me, I was adamant about not having debt when I'm retired. I don't want a mortgage when I'm retired. And I don't even want to pay for education when I'm retired because you're already done with the job. You use the education to work this place and you're still paying for it and you're 70 or you're 65, that, that's, that makes no sense to me. That's absolutely ludicrous. So for me, it's the passion about the literacy part, helping people manage through the mud of their own paycheck and their minds, because I said that emotional part is what really stumps you and what, you know, trips you up. You know, no man ever stubs his toe against the mountain. It's usually the little pebbles that bring him down. And when you are in the middle of your life, it's hard to kind of get through those things. So basically, I start with that budget piece and make sure, hey, let me see where you really are. Do you have any money left over out of your pay? And what we can do with that. And then look at what you're spending your money on. 
And you have to have conversations with people about that because a lot of times what they'll do is they'll tell you bits and pieces like when they go to the doctor. Oh, well, you know, this, this hurts just a little bit or you don't say anything. And as the conversation goes on, well, I've been having this back pain in my back. Well, when you tell the whole story, the doctor can help you. So I know that everyone's not gonna tell me that they're spending $10 a day on a specific drink or whatever it is, or you know something that's truly extravagant, you kind of pull that out along the way. And when you start to go through the list, you see things that can be taken away that after a while you don't miss. It's just like cleaning that clutter. You don't wanna get rid of it. Then all of a sudden you don't miss it when your house looks nice and new and brand new. It's still the same concept. Then, but even before we get that, we address your credit. You know, a lot of people still don't understand credit and every time their credit changes because you have all of this stuff now, everybody's coming at you with the one on your phone and the mobile this and the mobile that. Stop looking at it every single day because it is gonna be in flux. You could buy a home, you can, you know, open up new credit or you may not be doing anything or you just paid off a bill. It's gonna change with all of those things because it's in flux and you're making movements. So let's look at your credit. Let's make sure you have, um, you don't have any issues. And if you do, how we can address them and get those cleared away so you can start building on that. And then we go into the budget. And, and on all of that, we still have to organize. Some people's, you know, uh, uh, handling of bills is a hot mess. They have no organization. They don't know where their bills are. They don't know when they come in, even if it's electronic, because I know I have a lot of folks, that's where we move to electronic. But if you have it come in your email and you have thousands of emails because that's what we have in our inboxes, where's your bill? Oh, I forgot to pay the light bill. Now they're cutting your lights out because you're a month or two behind and no one wants to give you grace anymore. You don't know where your stuff is. You know, and then I go step by step and give you all the details and try to break it down for you because I know that we don't all have a lot of time and we don't all, we, we really don't have a large uh, attention span. You know, Jonathan posted on one that I think it was like pay half attention. I forget the whole thing uh, of it, right? The one where you're like partially paying attention. Well, that's what people are doing. They don't want to take that time. So I try to give bite sized um, pieces of the information to you so you can take it, absorb it, get it in and apply it. That happened at a church event I did. It was on credit repair workshop. The young lady attended the program and, you know, I hadn't seen her, you know, for a minute. I went back to that church a few years later to do another um, event and she came to my table. I was a vendor there. She said, do you remember me? And I said, you do look familiar. She said, I took your um, class two, a couple of years ago um, and I took your advice and I applied it and now my house is in underwriting. So, I was excited because this is a millennial and everyone says they don't listen, they don't know, they can't. Yes, they can. If you're giving them the right information at the right time and speaking to what they need, you can help them. And I didn't know I was helping her that much in that, in that session. So all of these things can be done. So break it down step by step. And then I go into talking about retirement because um, there's a show, I'm not sure if anyone on this, uh, uh, on this session right now actually knows this show or remembers this show. It's Good Times. It's from ages ago. And um, they, <laughs> yes, I see a couple of laughs, but yes, it's an old show. It's back from what, the 70s. But I remember an episode on the show where the young kid saw a neighbor dumping her trash and he assumed that she had a dog because there was dog food. <laughs> Jesse, she had dog food cans in her garbage. And that affected me. Now, mind you, I'm, I'm a kid too. So I, that affected me. And that's the thing that drives me. I never wanted to be that person. First of all, I don't do dogs. So if you see dog food in my trash can, there's a problem. And I did not want that to be me because her social security check was not enough for her to manage and live through her life. So those things growing up, again, <laughs> those things again are, you know, uh, things that are catalyst for me to, to live this life and to teach this to other people and show them it's not that hard. You know, people are still like, I, you know, I just can't believe you've been out of work for two years. I'm like, I can, because I really did want to leave because I wanted to work full time on this business. They just helped usher me out the door. So, you know, I didn't necessarily leave. I was pushed, but I was okay with it because I knew I had a parachute. And when you think about all the money that you make over your lifetime, what you could do with that, we, we probably make into the millions over to our, our, our lifetimes. We may not make a million today or a million next year or every year, but we make enough to make it manage. All the people back then 
really knew how to do it. We may not have liked it. You know, once every new generation comes along, we have to do something different. The things that I teach about and most people teach about, that's what grandparents did. Great grandparents did. My grandmother was um, famous for saying, if you save just a dollar a week, you have $52 at the end of the year. And back then, that was a good amount of money. So save something. I'm always talking about that savings because when something happens, you want something to fall back on. So when you talk about my passion for it, I hope you can hear that three. Everyone says that because it is important for me to, for people to live a better financial life, to help you plant your money tree. You can do it one leaf at a time. You don't have to try to go out and water it and think the tree is going to grow overnight. No tree does that. So the same thing goes with the money. You know, as George says, you know, get comfy with your money. You have to get comfy with your money. Because if you don't, you're going to be running on that same rat wheel that over and over and over and going and making the same mistakes. And for me, I'm always teaching people it's about the emotions of it. Well, I have to have, well, I work hard, so I deserve this. You know what I deserve? Not to live a life that I'm struggling every day. Not to live a life that I'm sick over my finances. Now I have health issues. Because when your finances are in trouble, your health is sure to follow. Stress can kill anything. So if you don't take care of those particular things, then what's going to happen to you in the end? And some people think their children are a retirement plan. They're not. Some women think a man is a retirement plan. He's not. You are your retirement plan. Not anyone else, not, not Uncle Sam, not anybody else, because he gets his money off the top. You need to learn how to do the same. So um, I hope that is um, some good information for you to, to, to walk away with and you know, um, not going to our, our, our whole hour with trying to give, you know, a little tips and tidbits, um, you know, that's uh, for another space. But I hope that information, um, you know, helps you today to make some changes in what you need to do. You know, um, as Julie said, you know, being um, thinking about, you know, money and, you know, always, you know, being um, scared about it. Don't. It, it really is a tool. That's all it is. It's just how you manage it. When you when you know what's coming in, you can budget for things. I did a presentation um, back when I was getting my associate's degree at oral communications because I knew I wanted to speak in public. So I'm like, why not take this as an elective? So I took the class and the instructor, she raised her hand and she said, well, what about if you have, let me just say scattered income, meaning that she may work at the school part-time throughout the year. She may not work any other time. And, and other people who work some of the gig jobs, you work you know, a few months here, if you're in taxes and you do tax, you have tax, a tax company or you work at a tax company, tax season is from April to, um, I mean, from January to April, you know, what do you do if you have sporadic income? That's why you do need to create a budget because you can average out things and figure out I, this is what I need for every month. Whether you go low or high during that month is up to you because you can control your expenses. And that's one of the things I really like about this is because that can happen to anyone in their lifetime. You may not be working a full-time job from 24 or 25 until you're 65. And in today's society, that's very real. I'm the poster child of it right now. So, you know, it can happen to anyone, but if you manage your pay throughout that time, it doesn't matter. If I got a raise, it didn't change anything. If I got let go, it didn't change anything. But you have to be consistent in that. You have to be consistent in saving you have to be consistent in what you're doing and the changes you make. Don't just create a budget and walk away from it. You have to make tweaks along the way. You never know when things change. Like some people may, and maybe we have a baby now. Maybe our child is moving out of the house now. What do we do? Or maybe from month to month, things change because there's things going on in your life. You have to take the time to look at it because I promise you, no one else is going to be sitting down, taking the time to look at that um, for you. They may do it with you and now you're paying for it. So not saying that I don't like customers and don't want customers or clients, I, I definitely do that. But at the same time, people will help you, but you still have to do it. I can teach you how to ride a bike and tell you all that, but you still have to get out there and pedal. And that's the thing that most people won't do. They won't, um, you know, kind of pedal their way through. They want you to do everything and they still don't get the lesson. I want to teach you the lesson so you can have it and carry it through to the rest of your life. You have a lot of passion, Michelle. I love it. I feel <laughs> like, wow. Goodness sakes. Yeah, this, there's so much to be said about what you've shared already. I mean, obviously, you have developed this great 
passion and this relationship with money and teaching people. And there's a couple of things I want to touch on. Number one is, you know, ignorance is bliss and bliss is just the nickname for the blister we're carrying along with us called debt. And it's just, <laughs> it, it's just friction, right? It's all the friction from family, finance, school, everything when we have no options. And that's what planting your money tree really is. And I love that that's what you shared in your story. It's options. It's options on whether or not you need to take another job that you don't want to take. Or if you get restructured out of a company, maybe it's time to take on your own dream. And for so many of us in this community, that is, that's what we're building right now, right? We're trying to chase our entrepreneurial dream. And another thing you mentioned was sporadic income. When you're a business owner, it's sporadic income. I don't care how good you are. It's sporadic income. So these tips you're sharing with us are great. And then one of the last things I want to mention before I kind of open things up for, for comments and kudos was you mentioned early on in life that you went and you renovated your room and people, people naturally spend what they own, you know, what they make and what they own. And as they grow, they spend what they make and they own. And with your room, it's like the face to your space, right? If the face to your space is chaos, your growth and the amount of money you have will always be chaos. And you will always be trying to keep up. And one of the things I try to tell so many of, of my friends, especially those that are starting businesses, um, everything online is superficial. It's hard to see where people really live. And if you're trying to keep up with them, you're going to break yourself apart. And at the end of the day, if you're paying your bills and creating um, and creating an environment or a business, and you, you can end that month knowing you did everything you could and you've saved a little bit of money, you're not broke. You're just responsible. It's okay. You can be responsible and keep chasing that dream. So I have to appreciate you for that because just like that money tree, we grow into the things that we're capable of, of understanding. And if we don't start small with small steps and understanding our budget, we'll never get it under control anyways. Absolutely. And I love the fact that when you said that money tree growing, because it made me think of it provides financial shade. We all like to have that shade on that hot, sunny day and your finances could be a hot, sunny mess. So you want to have that tree. And the thing about the room reno is so funny. All I did was get paint and um, I got new flooring. And of course, you know, so, and, and I had some help, you know, with the painting part. But again, I remind people that I was 17. This was not some, you know, 40, 50 year old person renovating a home. This was just a room, but that's what I wanted to do. That was a need for me. And a lot of people don't realize when you're, you're building that, you're working on that money tree, that um, you know it can save you. So if it's being um, cheap for some people, I'm okay. You can call me cheap. I've been called that before. Frugal, you know, whatever you want to call it. But all I know is that all those years, those things were being said. It allowed me to pay off two student loans, and a car note, and a second car note. So when the restructuring came, I was able to actually move on. And I, I love that. I think that's so powerful because it, it going back to having that budget and having those savings and those plans, it's all about having options and in options. Life, that's, yes. that's what we want. So I love everything you shared. I know we could probably go for a full hour on just tips and tricks and things that people could instill, but obviously everything is up to personal need, right? And what we do here is as a community, we try to have conversation and dialogue. So I'd love to open it up to the community members here just for comments and kudos and, and questions. Yeah, I I, uh, I just wanted to say like you're spot on in terms of like so many things. Uh, one thing that uh, so I, I said that I don't know a lot about finances, but the stuff this stuff that you've talked about is stuff that that I've definitely heard before and have been following. So like one of the biggest things for for me and my family was um, probably I don't know ten years ago I read the uh, the Dave Ramsey book about um, the total money makeover, right and and I didn't honestly didn't get a lot out of that, but what I, the one thing that got out of it that changed everything for us was make a budget. And and what's here's what sold it on me because there was my my wife tried to get me to make a budget for a long time and I just wouldn't do it because I didn't want the restriction. I was like I and it was the whole thing with sporadic income and like I don't know how much is coming in. I don't know what what to well, I don't even know what to put down. So, but what, what I learned from that book and what, what changed it for me was, was this, is that if you, uh, every time, if you're living outside of a budget, you don't have a budget, you're just living willy nilly. Every time you go and you buy something, you have this little feeling of guilt that, that nags at you. Like, you know, that you shouldn't probably be doing this, right? 
but if you make a budget and you budget those things in, now you've given yourself permission to do that. And, and when you go to do it, guess what? You don't feel bad about it anymore because you know, hey, it's okay that I do this because I, I gave myself permission through, the, through budgeting with it. So I just wanted to share that in case anybody else is listening is, is like on the fence. Like that was what did it for me. Uh, and, but what you've said, all of the things you said are just, are just great. We're, we're at the place where we, we only have our, our mortgage. That's the only thing that we have. And I think that's a lot of people have that, but, uh, you know, got rid of credit card debt, get rid of your, your car payment, just get rid of it if you can. Yes. You made a key point, Jesse. Um, you know, having that budget is helpful and, um, you know, you don't have that guilt because even, you know, I can say this and I have no shame in that, but, you know, there's months I was busy. I didn't keep up, you know, with the expenses because every month I, I work on that. So I would be behind. And in those times, I would not spend. Like, how could you honestly go spend and you really don't know where everything is? You know, like, okay. And for me, it was still, it was simple, but I didn't just like total that out and, 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 and put this here and put that there. So, and guess that was a punishment for myself. And, you know, um, you have to know where your money is going. And you also said that, you know, a lot of people may be in that situation. They're not. Just like Adam said, you know, you everything is online. You know, everything looks great. You know, like I'm, I'm looking, you know, you, your room looks great. You look like you're a musician. You have a, a piano and a guitar. I mean, think you have loads of money and you're doing great. You never know how bad someone's doing because they don't share that. Most people are embarrassed. They don't want to talk about what they can't afford. So you're way ahead of the game and kudos to you for even uh, uh, doing that. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear, you know, that feedback because I didn't have a Dave Ramsey when I was 17. This is right now Michelle Alexander. So I learned these lessons from someplace. I just feel like it's a gift. But and I want to share that with others so they can be able to have that same thing to just have that mortgage. Because if you are restructured or fired or lay off from laid off from your job and you have all these bills, things will look totally different. Well, no. I'm gonna jump in and just say I absolutely love the passion that you have around what you do because you. you did not miss a beat when you were talking about like what you do and the advice and I just love that Michelle I mean and and kudos for being so articulate um but it's it's something that you know I'm kind of personally I don't know if I'm passionate about it, but I've been kind of a stickler since I was young. I was fortunate to grow up with a father who was all about saving and he pounded that into us. And I think I was, of the three of us, I was the only one that listened to, listened to him. And so it's been pretty important. And, and I've, I've been fortunate along the way. Um, and, but, you know, to Jesse's point about, and you made too about that guilt thing, like none of us need to, to go and buy something and feel guilty about it. We should feel good about it and we should treat ourselves sometimes and have that wiggle room in our lives to be able to do those types of things. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's like, it's not fun. You know, it just always hangs over your head. So, and I love Jesse that you budget. It's great. Yes, me too. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for the share. And, and Jesse, thank you for, you know, sharing your experience as well. It's weird how counterintuitive it is when you think you're restricting yourself, but in the yes. end, you're actually giving yourself more opportunities and options when it really matters. So I love that. So I guess I would say the same thing. I'm just kind of hearing um, what Michelle's saying and writing all these notes and kind of thinking myself as a free spirit artist, surfer. And so I never really, like Jesse said, wanted to budget because I felt like it inhibited me and my creativity and my freedom and that, you know, kind of comes and goes. And I was just really good at kind of holding it all together. But as I got, I've gotten older and kids and single mom, like that, um, uh, technique is no longer working. So um, just loving the feedback that the budget actually creates more freedom versus less freedom. And that just clicked in my head for the first time in a long time. And just being super grateful to hear Michelle and then Jesse and other people's perspective about how it actually creates freedom and doesn't inhibit it just completely changed my whole perspective on my budget and financing. Yeah, another, yeah, that's so cool, Julie. Um, the other thing I was going to say was, you know, if, if you have a mortgage like I do, um, 
there's, you know, the, the house taxes, right? And so many people get like surprised that we have house taxes twice a year. And, and in California, they always come at the worst time. They come at tax season and they come right before Christmas, which really sucks. So like one of the things I try to do is bake that into our monthly expenses so that when they come, it's not like, oh my God, I've got to come up with how much money it's, we've already got it covered. Um, the other thing I was going to mention with budgeting, which is kind of interesting, um, I have a friend that budgets and she never budgets enough. And so like stuff comes up, you know, stuff happens like a flat tire or things like that. Right. And it's always this like mad scramble for like, where am I going to come up with that money? So it's like, again, you know, when you're budgeting, try to budget in extra stuff for the unexpected or the fun, right? Because we all need to have fun. Um, and I think a lot of people don't think about that. They think just like, oh, these are my bills and that's how, that's what I need to cover for budget. And I've got it all covered. Yes, you know, um, that's a good point uh, too, Rachel. And I saw a couple of comments come through said about car maintenance and home maintenance. Yes, all of that. You know, it's just a line item. I mean, and because I had accounting in, uh, in school, that was one of my favorite subjects in high school and actually scored high enough that I didn't have to take the midterm or the final. And I just fell in love with it. So the passion, like I said, has been there, but they have line items, you know, you know, everything is a line item. So whether you have entertainment, you have car maintenance, you have home maintenance, you have annual fees, you know, everything should be based out monthly. And basically that's how you get paid. You get paid maybe every two weeks or some people get paid every month or what have you, but you pay bills monthly. You should be working from that aspect. You shouldn't have to be surprised about anything except for this, because I experienced it. So now I know what other people are talking about. You go to the doctor or a medical facility for something. You pay because you think that's what you owe and that's what they tell you. But lo and behold, two weeks later, here comes another bill. Oh, this is for the technician. Oh, this is for the doctor. Oh, this is for the exam. There's something that comes along. And some people get stuck with that on their credit report. But I say that to me, there's really no such thing as an unexpected bill. You know, you purchased something. You know, you went to the doctor's office. You know, you went somewhere that a bill may be coming in. When you have that line item, whether you, I don't really like miscellaneous because everything has a name. Put that down as something so you don't have the, um, that unexpected. And even though um, I didn't mention this before, I want to say it now, and I know that's one of the things that uh, Dave Ram Ramsey has uh, supported or talked about too. I do use envelopes still to this day. I started doing those at that set, that 18 year old person at that first job, there were some, I call them extra envelopes, but they're probably for something, but I use them to count out my money and put away what I needed to do. So in order for me to get back to that job, there was always transportation money taken out. There was lunch money taken out. Everything was taken out so I can eat and arrive to that place for the next two weeks and whatever bills I had to pay. You know, now my rent went from $10 to $50 a month because now I have a real job. So, and this is it staying at home, you know, um, you know, with my mom, but you have to plan for those things. You have to put those things out. So it, it, it all is that key. And it really does boil down to discipline at the end of the day. Yeah. And it's, and it's all a line item, right? Because uh, retirement and savings should be a line item. You should be line doing that. As it's if at the top. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick. At the top. Okay, guy, I'm having trouble here. I came out of a client. Um, now, Michelle, I, I'm sorry I'm late. First of all, I want to apologize for that. But I, I love what you're saying. I think people look at budgeting like it's a punishment. And, you know, we're all small business people. And budgeting is a reward. And I think that, um, you know, the old saying, people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Um, I, I look at budgeting. It's almost like, you know, looking at, like, your diet. And it shouldn't be restrictive. You need to eat. You need to spend. Uh, and you have to have a plan for when to stop. Uh, and your common sense approach, I think, uh, is why you're so successful because you know, you, you're you walking the walk and talking the talk. So my kudos to you. Oh, thank you for that, Patrick. And I, I just have to appreciate you again today, Michelle, because the grass is green where you water it and that includes your money tree, right? So if you take the small steps and the meaningful direction of, making changes in the way that you approach your relationship with money and making changes in the way that you see budgeting, not as a restriction, but as an abundance mentality. And you start learning these tools and you work with somebody like you, 
it's so much easier to understand and make stride and get further in life. And when things surprise you or opportunities come up and options are available, it's just so powerful knowing that somebody like Michelle was in your corner and helped you get to that point where you can say yes, or if you want to, you can say no, it's okay. So thank you for that. Like I said, I appreciate, you know, being here and a part of this community. It's really been my pleasure. And um, I've learned a lot and, you know, just everyone else's share. I think Julie was my first uh, attendant. So I loved her story and, you know, that just got me excited and, you know, going through the rest of, um, you know, the, the uh, shares. But, you know, again, we are, I won't say we're all in the same boat on that, but kind of we are because when you are a, a small business owner or solopreneur, you're going to go through those changes, no matter, you know, how well you manage this area, that area, you're going to go through those changes. So having that support um, is awesome, but also managing that money is what is key, because if you don't manage your personal money well, you won't, ha ha you won't manage your business money well. That's why a lot of people, I think, um, was it the, what's his, what's his name, Tay, um, that was on a few months ago, um, not months ago, a few weeks ago, and talked about why a lot of people couldn't get the PPE loans because their businesses weren't running, operating correctly. Just because you open up a brick and mortar doesn't mean you, you know what you're doing. Just because you have an online business even doesn't mean you know what you're doing. You still have to manage things. And if you don't have the right paperwork, you don't have things in order, you can't apply for a loan. So the same thing personally, you don't have your paperwork in order, you don't know where your bills are, you don't know what you have to pay, you don't know, you just pay bills. You, don't, you, you really don't have any organization and you have to have that if you wanna manage those things correctly. But um, I promise you, I do know it works. It's, I, I tell you, I'm that living story, um, you know, and don't, who cares what people call you? You, you? you only, if you answer to it, that's when it's a problem. Who cares, you know, think what you want, say what you want, but managing those things will help you through those tough times because sometimes you may be out of work for a year. People keep talking about three to six months, you know, worth of um, emergency savings. I never really taught that. I would say it because it was there, but I always ad lib to that. You really need to have six to nine. Now that was in 20 something or other, like 10 or 11 or 12. Right now you need to have a year or more. No. I don't care if the job market is opening up a bit, you know, because people are not working, but most of the people who, and I'm, I'm not, I want to say it kindly, I'm not judging anyone, but most of the jobs that seem to be opening are the jobs that, you know, we may not want. You may not be, you know, I, I didn't work at Burger King already, so I'm not probably not going to go work there today. So you think about it, you, it's, 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 it could be a long time. And my whole point about it is you have to have that emergency funds. You have to have that savings and all of those take time to grow. You just don't wake up and save the $550. It may have taken you a couple of years and each year you grow on that. You add to that. Don't just stay at 20. Don't stay at the 25. Each year you can grow to that. And once you start, you keep going, you know? And of course, the, about the 401ks, I wanted to throw that in as well. I know that, but some people don't have access to a 401k. And what do you do? Oh, well, I just don't say that's not an option for me. <laughs> that, I don't even want to hear that. That's not an option. So, yeah. I love it. I mean, it's such an appropriate conversation right now between the great weight and people rediscovering themselves and yes. overcoming fear to launch a business. Mm -hmm. And there are so many tools that we can talk about and teach, like the rule of 72 and compound interest. Yes. Which we're touching on. And I love that. But I think. I love that you started with the basis, setting that foundation and understanding that if you're going to plant a money tree that's going to be strong and stable, it's got to have strong roots. And those roots come from doing the things that, that are difficult at first, but will open up options in the future. So thank you for everything you shared today, Michelle. And thank you for the conversation and for the community members that are here today for inviting us into, into your lives and sharing your stories. You know, Jesse and Julie, you guys shared some fantastic uh, stories based on your own experiences. And Patrick, thank you for the comments and, and Rachel yeah. and George for being here. So mm -hmm. thank you everybody for being here. I know we're at the end of our hour. Um, Michelle, we love to send the community members to connect with you and follow and see where they can commit to engage and maybe elevate themselves a little more. Where can we send them that will be most impactful? Um, I, I, I can't say just one. It's really my website. That's ajmfinancial.com. And there, I should say just that one. 
you can, can you can um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's I'm talking about money every week. There's a year of action theme that's going on, kind of similar to that's on LinkedIn, and it's all about action verbs. What you can do with this action verb. I think this week is either influence or something like that, but each week has that. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, or you can just reach out to me, um, you know, on the contact page, or you can read the blog page or you can um, subscribe for the e-newsletter, which comes out once or twice a month. So I'm not bombarding you. It's very informational. But if you can reach out that way, I will surely get in touch with you. I love it. And you'll learn something. I, lo I love it. Thank you for your passion and thank you for sharing everything with us today. And thank you to the community members. Hopefully you guys got a lot out of this and we will catch up next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.